So let's hear it from Pia Melling, Managing Director at Greg Green. Thank you so much uh, for welcoming me. I will give you a few minutes uh, presentation um, about an important ESG initiative that uh, our company is starting. So, Greek Green, we're a Norwegian company. We've been around uh, since uh, 2010, and we are experts in ship recycling. And as many of you know, India is a very big uh, supplier of ship recycling yards, uh, together with uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan is definitely recycling most of the world fleet, and also Turkey is, uh, is quite significant. So, we have been surveying 150 recycling projects all around the world, many of them in India, in Alang, uh, and in other areas in Asia and in Europe. Uh, we advise ship owners on how to select a yard that has good practice, both in terms of safety and environmental protection. And we've also done uh, more than 2,000 inventories of hazardous materials. And you know the world fleet is growing rapidly um, and is also aging rapidly. So this is a very complex slide, but it shows that there's going to be a wave of ships uh, that need to be recycled over the next 10 years. Uh, BIMCO has estimated that there's going to be 15,000 ships globally that reach their end of life, which is double of what happened the last decade. And there is an issue here that we might not have enough capacity uh, of really good yards to recycle all these ships. And we are also worried that when the yards get very busy, uh, that um, there are more risks of accidents and incidents. Because this ship recycling industry is actually one of the more um, hazardous jobs uh, in the world. Um, it's, it's a lot of risks, both in terms of hazardous materials and, uh, and, and in general uh, health and safety risks while you're working on uh, dismantling a ship. Uh, there is finally the Hong Kong Convention for Safe and environmentally sound ship recycling was ratified this year. The convention was <laughs> adopted in 2009, uh, and only now it's been ratified, and in two years it will enter into force. But this convention, it gives you a statement of compliance if you reach a certain minimum standard, but it does not cover everything. And it's a binary, uh, it's a yes or no, you have a, a statement of compliance with the Hong Kong Convention or you don't. And we know the world is not binary, it's gradually developing, so uh, we believe it might not be sufficient uh, to, to say what is the real quality of these yards and how do they relate to each other and how can they actually um, improve continuously. Uh, but there's also other legislation, especially in the EU, that is kicking in now uh, around transparency and uh, corporate uh, sustainability reporting directive, which is really pushing the shipping industry and ship owners in general to take responsibility in their whole supply chain, and especially around workers' conditions and human rights. And yards then come up quite high on that list of um, suppliers where the ship owners do spend a lot of money, but also where there is a certain risk of, um, of disadvantages uh, on the working environment. So, um, we also see that a lot of charters and the banks and the, and the private equity funds and capital markets in general really start to care uh, about not only the emissions of the ships, but actually the su supply chain of the shipping companies and how um, they are working with the whole ESG agenda. Uh, and these last points, apart from the Hong Kong Convention, of course, also applies to other yards, not only recycling yards, but repair yards and new building yards. So that leads me uh, to what we call yard score, which is something that our company just initiated, but we would like it to be like an industry-wide initiative to really measure ESG performance uh, for uh, recycling and repair yards as a start, and then hopefully later with new building yards. Uh, then we can really bring transparency into how the yards are operating and make sure that those yards that invest in good infrastructure and in good processes and health and safety and protection of their workers actually get more business. 
that is very important. And today, if there is no such a yard uh, score available as, as to our knowledge on a global scale. Um, so we believe that then the ship owners and the banks and the insurance companies and every stakeholder in our maritime industry can actually you know, uh, enable their ambitions on ESG because this is an area where it's not very costly or very difficult to make a difference. Uh, you actually just need to make some informed choices and you need to uh, pay attention to what's happening and that's as easy as that. So you only care a little bit and then you will actually make a big difference. Uh, both for the environment and, and for people who work in the yards. And of course, also for the yards, it can be very important to benchmark against other yards in the same region or, or globally as well. For example, we think that some of the Indian ship recycling yards are better than some of the yards in Turkey that EU has approved. Um, so this is important to show how they compare to other yards and in the different aspects. And the last point is that if all of us, you know, as ship owners, we go and uh, do our own due diligence on the yard, like let's say one yard has to accept 100 companies to come and ask more or less the same questions and report 100 times to different companies, that's just a waste of time for everybody. So we think we should, we should do this together and we should share data and, um, and then work on uh, improvements rather than just collecting the data. So we have developed a questionnaire together with many industry partners to cover these four areas, uh, environment and climate, which includes CO2 emissions on the yard, but also the material flow. Where does the material come from? Where does it go to? And this is where India really has an advantage because it's a truly circular economy. Uh, the, the, it's a lot of uh, steel that's being reused here with very little emissions in the production. And actually most of the ships Equipment is being reused, upcycled, converted into new products in India. So that's uh, really an advantage compared to Europe, where much more is, is waste, basically. Of course, we're looking at the social responsibility, human rights aspects, workers' conditions, health and safety, uh, and technical efficiency. You need a certain infrastructure, of course, to do a safe and uh, environmentally sound job. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we will start doing this for the recycling yards and the repair yards globally, and it's quite an undertaking, um, and eventually we might move into new building yards. But we are working also uh, across the industry, as I mentioned, and here in India we have uh, a partner, Nivyash, who I will also meet uh, on Thursday, to help us uh, do uh, also the yard audits, because we want to do physical audits in addition to self-reporting from the yards to actually verify that uh, what they're claiming is uh, true. Um, and then we believe, uh, you know, we could share this data into many systems and we could also offer um, in our, with our network in the industry uh, improvement and training and help the yards get to a better level. Uh, this is just a mock-up of how it might look, uh, where you can actually, as a yard, see how you how you score on these various four items that I mentioned and how you rank according uh, to um, other yards in your region or globally and also perhaps who's actually been, what potential customer group has potentially has been looking at your yard and could bring business to your yard. So these are some of the um, reference group or first uh, customers that we work with. Uh, there's a lot of Western European, Northern European ship owners that are very interested in this and, and of course all the banks that have signed uh, both on the Poseidon principles and in general to be to offer responsible financing um, and we are developing this also together with BIMCO and the Norwegian Ship Owner Association and many other ship owner associations. So it's work in progress, we're just starting this questionnaire and testing with some yards but um, we are very uh, keen to collaborate with more companies and we really want this to be an industry movement towards more transparency uh, in, on the ESG subjects for yards so that basically business can flow to the yards that invest in this uh, and that it can just be, become better and better. In the world of shipping, sustainable practices are steering us towards a future where our seas and ships coexist harmoniously, 
fostering a healthier planet. More on this is our next session, Sustainable Shipping Practices, Best Practices and Case Studies from the Industry. And this session will be moderated by Pia Melling. And the eminent panel includes Captain Milin K. Patankar, Head Ship Owning Division, Transworld Group and MDSSLL. Daljit Singh Kohli, India Representative for Port of Antwerp and Bruges. Kaylee Murphy, Head of Corporate Communications at Atlas Corp and C-SPAN Corporation. Her Excellency, Yasil Burilo, Ambassador and Council General for Government of Panama. Please welcome the eminent panel. Thank you for joining. Uh, now we're seated in the right order here as well, so you could uh, keep track of who we are. Uh, so we discussed a little bit in the break, you know, this is a diversity and inclusion conference, so why do we talk about environmental sustainability? But of course, that is the big challenge that our industry is facing. Uh, we need to decarbonize our vessels, we need to work smarter and differently, and definitely we also then need uh, to have people from the whole talent pool and not only um, one part of the population. So we need diversity, definitely, to, to solve these challenges. So uh, today's topic is sustainable shipping practices. We want to go through some best practice examples from the industry. And we are focusing mainly on uh, the environment because that is, of course, the biggest challenge that we are facing right now. Uh, so thank you all for joining, dear panelists. Um, I think I will start with um, uh, Captain Melinda Patankar. Um, you know you are both the ship owner, operator and uh, logistics provider in Transworld. Uh, could you maybe explain a little bit about what you are doing in terms of decarbonizing uh, your fleet? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, brother. So, is it morning or? Just about, on the clock. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Pia, and uh, for getting me in into this. Did I get you right by saying you wanted to know more about the decarbonization? Yes. The sound isn't very clear. Was it's, the sound not clear? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it has to be closer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so if you permit me, I'll just like to take the uh, journey of Transworld through the, uh, through the uh, process of decarbonization that, that we're all talking about in today's uh, shipping world. So to begin with, I think uh, I'll make a comment is that roughly it's about 16% of the global GHG uh, contribution or emissions that we do is from the transportation sector. I believe it's close to 3% only that is being done by the shipping industry per se. So it's quite a small segment to begin with. I think we all from the shipping industry must be proud that we have embraced this on a global platform to see how this could be reduced, uh, whether it's the Paris Convention that we all hear about or whether anything that happens on the maritime sector. I think we have embraced it very, very challenged. This challenge has been taken up very well by the shipping industry. At Transworld, we always had the awareness about the GHG emissions and the pollution that was caused not just by the fuels but also by the sewage, by the garbage and various other things. But I will not shy away from saying that it was essentially the, the regulations that came in which has prompted the entire industry on a fast track to deal with this kind of an menace as the whole world today looks at. So how did we begin with? I think first and foremost there was a will uh, from the topmost level to deal with this complex problem that the industry was suffering. We started off essentially by uh, through a mechanism of data gathering. We based it on the year 2020-21 and we gathered a lot of data in terms of emissions. The data itself was gathered on three distinct platforms. To begin with, we set scope one, which is to deal with the emissions from the ships. The scope two, we thought about the purchase power that we use in our business. And the scope three had to do with the emissions by our stakeholders. So a lot of data was gathered. This was crunched. This was analyzed. And this provided us a kind of a baseline for the year 2021-22. And based on this baseline, we could then draw up the targets 
Some of them were driven by regulations like SIMP, EXXI, and CII. Many of you must be familiar with these. And these did put some kind of a target that the shipping industry and the individual companies needed to achieve. So once the targets were set, Transworld, I'm proud to say, has also voluntarily reached a target. They have declared a target to be carbon neutral as an organization by the year 2043, which is far ahead of the, of the you know, regulatory benchmarks which the IMO has raised. Now, having laid the targets, of course, the next plan was how to go about meeting with those targets. So we had a mechanism whereby everything gets driven from top in terms of the strategy at the board level. Then we have cross-section uh, functional heads who actually draw the action plan to deal with the strategy as to how these targets would be achieved. Then it comes to the business heads and the financial heads of each one of the units to kind of mentor, to kind of educate the staff therein. And then we also identify champions in this particular area to take this whole thing forward. So that has been the methodology. I will not dwell into the common technical uh, various energy efficiency measures which the industry has adopted in terms of the hull painting, hull cleaning, and of course, you know, the various things that we are all familiar with. But in particular, I'd like to take Pia, an example of our partnership in collaboration with Watsila, whom again many of you all would have known. So in December 22, we signed up an agreement with Watsila for doing a decarbonization modeling on one of our ships that we chose. And this ship has been monitored now close to a year now. This is monitored very closely in terms of our emissions. And a kind of a profiling or a decarbonization modeling has been now created for this particular vessel. And the energy saving various measures, these are now being superimposed on this model to see what would be their effect. So there are two or three alternatives that we have been looking at very closely. And the ship is then coming up for dry docking in the month of February 24, when these modifications would be done. And this would be our exper uh, you know, experiment that we did. Uh, independently, we also partnered with a couple of uh, organizations. I would name them as Storm Geo, who do a lot of in terms of compliance with EXX and CII for us. And there's another organization by the name Zero North who do voyage optimization and such other things to increase the energy efficiency on board our ship. So there's a lot of collaboration that happens across the industry through various stakeholders. And I'm proud to say at Transfer, in the last one year, on a year-on-year -year basis, we've, been, we've achieved to reduce our greenhouse emissions by close to 6% on a year-on-year -year basis as compared to our benchmark in the last year itself. So that's our journey. That's Thank good. You. Thank you. And collaboration is... Yeah, would you be a round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> collaboration in the value chain is, of course, super important here. So I wanted to ask you, Kaylee, um, on behalf of C-SPAN, uh, how are you collaborating with your partners to make uh, this difficult challenge uh, solved? Indeed it is, so thank you, Pia. Um, so for those of you who don't know, C-SPAN is the largest independent operator owner of contain and lesser of container ships. By, with our very aggressive and ambitious new build program, we'll be having around 200 vessels with a capacity of 2 million TEU by the end of next year, so very exciting. And decarbonization is at the top of our mind as we continue to grow out our fleet. And so for C-SPAN, Decarbonization is not just about meeting internationally regulated targets, but it's really about exceeding them. And so we are attempting to do that with our decarbonization strategy, which is based on four really important pillars. The first of which is continuous efficiency improvements. We're also looking at transition pathways, fleet insights, and market-based initiatives in order to achieve these goals. So for continuous efficiency improvements. This is known as our saver concept. And so C-SPAN operates vessels on time charter and we um, work with our liner customers who manage the speed and the trade routes and so we don't control that. So we need to look at other opportunities to reduce our emissions and we do that by vessel modifications and retrofits and vessel design as part of our asset development program. And so 
The SAVER initiative was established way back in 2011. It was our first sort of foray into this. SAVER stands for C-SPAN Action on Vessel Energy Reduction. And it looks at reducing our fuel usage as well as our cargo loadability. So trying to move more cargo with less fuel. Since we've implemented the SAVER program, we've seen a, approximately a 25% reduction in our emissions, which equates to about 9 million tons of abatement. Um, so it's very exciting. And um, today we build all of our ships based on our SAVER strategy. The second pillar is transition pathways. And this is our clean blue initiative, which is looking at fuel transitions and what transition opportunities are available to us to explore them and see what approach is going to be appropriate for us going forward in partnership with our customers. So we work really closely day to day with our customers to discuss their decarbonization journey and how we can facilitate that with the goal of developing a fleet of and a portfolio of vessels that is really alternative fuel customer inspired. An example of this um, is our LNG uh, vessel delivery. So we have our 15,000 TEU and our 7,000 TEU LNG dual fuels that are being built currently. The, in partnership with one of our customers, Zim. Um, the first one was delivered back in February. That was the Zim Sammy Ofer. Since then, we've seen five more 15,000 TEU vessels and two 7,000 TEU vessels join our fleet. Uh, the most recent of which actually was the Zim Coral, which just embarked on her maiden voyage uh, last week. So, very exciting. These vessels are 25 vessels of our overall 70 vessel new build program. And last I checked, that ratio is um, higher than the global order book for proportionality of dual fuel um, versus conventional fuels. And so that's terribly exciting. But we are, of course, seeing a general trend of um, shipbuilding looking at all sorts of other lower carbon fuel options and alternative fuels such as methanol, and ammonia. And we too are collaborating on um, future fuels. So we are working with partners such as the Maersk McKinney Moeller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. And we recently commissioned a um, company called Foreship to design a very innovative 15,000 TEU ammonia fueled ship. Um, that did receive an approval in principle from the American Bureau of Shipping back in July. And quite proudly, earlier this month, it did that ship design received an award at the Green for Sea Europort uh, conference as the ship design of the year. So lots of exciting things happening there. Uh, pillar number three, of course, is Fleet Insights. And this is all about the data. And my colleague here talked a lot about the data, and it's incredibly important because if you're not measuring and monitoring your emissions, um, you can't uh, improve what you can't measure. So we are looking at, of course, also our scope one. Scope one is those emissions that are company old and owned and controlled resources. Um, so things like engines on board and auxiliary equipment. And then scope two, of course, those indirect emissions generated from purchased energy. And so C-SPAN has got a plan in place to look at reporting out on those scope two emissions in the near term. Beyond that, pillar number four is our market-based initiatives. And these are really the business and financial levers that are available to us. Things like sustainability-linked financing, blue and green bonds, and other types of financial levers. So sustainability-linked financing um, are financial instruments and loans that are tied to the sustainability performance of the borrower. And so there are financial incentives or financial penalties that are associated with the terms and um, tied to the borrower's performance against these preset sustainability targets. C-SPAN has been a leader uh, in this area and was one of the first entrants in our sector into this type of financing. In our 2022 sustainability report, you'll see that we had reported out on $500 million worth of sustainability-linked loans, including the first one that was issued in the container shipping sector. 
Also, $750 million of blue transition bonds, and these funds were used to facilitate our LNG dual fuel program that I mentioned. And um, that included the largest blue transition bond issued globally, which did win an award as the largest blue transition bond in 2021. Um, and then of course we have our $2.5 billion sustainability linked financing program for our overall new build um, program. So there's a lot of really exciting things going on there. Part of the market-based initiatives pillar is also um, we recognize that if we're going to be creating lower carbon vessels for our customers, we're going to need to facilitate accessibility to those lower carbon fuels as it relates to their availability as well as their costs. And so we have created what's called the Chase the Molecule Initiative, which is a deep dive on the production and supply chains related to alternative fuels. Um, so that we can build up the sort of knowledge base and partnerships required to make those accessible for the future of the industry as we see more and more vessels looking to transition. So those are the four main pillars. Uh, just to recap, we've got continuous efficiency improvements, transition pathways, our fleet insights, as well as a strong market-based initiatives program. Thank you. That's, you're doing a lot. It's impressive. Yeah. So uh, let's move to you, uh, Yasiel, uh, because as a representative of the government of Panama, you're basically representing three different roles, right? You're a ship registry, you're operating the canal, and you are also uh, a country. Uh, could you say a little bit about how you work to support this uh, decarbonization journey that the shipping industry is undertaking? Yes, thank you, Pia, for the question, and thank you, Sanjam, for the invitation um, to this uh, distinguished panel. Um, yes, um, I would like to begin first by saying that um, if you Google Panama, you will know that Panama is a carbon negative country already. And as a carbon negative country, and our commitment is to support in all our service through our worldwide maritime um, services uh, through the Panama Ship Registry, the Panama Canal, and our internal laws as a country, um, being uh, known as, as the supporters of this carbonization transition, and we want to support all our customers in using our products and services with this. So let's begin by the Panama Canal. As some of you may know, the Panama Canal is, is through a, a, a very tough situation of, of drug. It's not a surprise for us. Already the Panama Canal, when it was construct, constructed in 1914, uh, it was constructed in, in, in such a way that when we have these kind of conditions, we can use more water and by recycling it and by many other ways. I will explain later uh, what we are doing, but let me first um, talk about how we use sustainability and, 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 and to um, move in this. So we have like different kind of plans, plan A until plan D to make the Panama Canal uh, operational still. So the plan A is that when the Panama Canal was constructed, and it, it was protected by law, but uh, uh, the Panama Canal watershed, which is like, and every time you pass through the Panama Canal, you, you will see it surrounded by woods. All the road is green. So it is green because we need the forest and the woods to attract the rain and the precipitation. Panama is one of the fifth countries in the world with more precipitation according to the World Bank. So this is an advantage for us. It's such an advantage that last year we used 82% of our energy consumption by renewable only, uh, by hydraulic electricity. So that's a blessing for us as a country. So our plan A is to make this huge reservoir called the, the Lake Gatun to attract all this water and, and, and always count with 50% of the water for the population and 50% for the Panama Canal operation. Our plan B was um, um, in 1950, we passed through a drug also. And, and what we do is uh, uh, something called the cross-filling process. So we have uh, the, the first lock of the Panama Canal in which one uh, ships are going from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa. So we do a, like a coordination of recycling water between 
both logs. And with this uh, simple methodology, we can save five transit uh, of, of, of ships, like five transit of waters. And, and, and this is already used in, in, this, in this truck too. Also as a plan C, uh, when we do the second lock of the Panama Canal, this second lock, which is for post Panama especially, and was constructed by, with 16 basin that recycles 60% of the water. So imagine, right now we are passing through a truck and we have already recycled so much water because of the very intelligent engineering beside the Panama Canal. And still, we are until this situation that we have to reduce the ships that are passing through our land um, because we have to save this water for the next year. Um, it is important to mention that also in August, we just have a challenge. And our plan D, again, is that our multimodal system. We have this um, big uh, new Panamax passing through the canal. It's called the Evermax. It's a brand new ship. And this Evermax uh, um, doesn't have the, 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 the draft that it was needed to pass through the Panama Canal. There is a minimum of 45 feet draft that every ship have to uh, comply to pass through the Panama Canal. So what uh, we do to, to transit this uh, super huge ship is to use our multimodal system. Uh, our dry canal pass the, it's about 1,500 TEU that has to be passed through the land. So by uh, highways, connected highways from Colon Container Terminal to the Balboa port, in the Pacific, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and through the dry canal at the same time. So we have a multimodal system. It's not only the Panama Canal. We have to think about you know, extra ideas to move all the containers, because actually the Panama Canal is a reduction of, of CO2 emissions to the planet. It's so important that all the ships are just um, passing this shortcut because if they use other routes, the emissions will be higher. So actually, we are like reducing so much in East Ranch to the emission for a ship. And um, yes, that's the, the idea of these all uh, plans together. And of course, we have as a country the National Water Program, uh, which will reserve the water not only from the canal, but for the whole country and the save of, of all. And we have this program until 2050. We have talked about that already. Um, and the Panama Canal has some incentive for ships that are transiting through our, um, our land. So um, let me just mention one. It's just uh, to share best practices, because this is about decarbonization. So um, the Panama Canal doesn't make like um, a discount in money. But what we do is incentives like um, encouraging all the shipping companies that are really working on this. And your companies, of course, do. So um, the one is the online emission calculator that was launched in 2014, in which every ship that passed through the Panama Canal know how many CO2 emissions they have reducted. And every ship has uh, a measurement, and every company can use this data to show themselves how are they say, are saving the planet. So another thing is the Green Connection. Green Connection is a program that uh, manages efficient routes by its emissions, operations, environmental ship index, and their design, and use of eco-friendly fuels. So, um, we have awarded already 1,500 1, chips since 2016 that we opened this um, incentive program. And around 10,000 transits have uh, passed through the canal by this green connection standards. So giving awards to ships and companies that are really making into the target is something that the Panama Canal wants to reinforce and, and encourage. Uh, we have an example of a catamaran called the Energy Observer that passed through the Panama Canal with zero emissions. And that's amazing. We have already um, done so. And there is another program called Environmental Premium Ranking, which 73 clients of the Panama Canal are under this database program in which, by hierarchy, they can um, transit through the Panama Canal because um, 
they are uh, such a good customers and they have reduced so much emissions that uh, we consider as a benefit for, for us to pass them through um, the Panama Canal. So this is regarding uh, this area of my country that is very important for the maritime sector and 6% of the world goods pass through the Panama Canal. Canal, it is estimated. So another um, thing, service in the portfolio is the Panama Ship Registry. The Panama Ship Registry was founded in 1920, so we have more than 100 years in this business. Um, what we have done is that we want to support the ship's owners in the construction of, 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 of new eco-friendly ships. When, 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 a, when a ship owner wants to register through the Panama Ship Registry, we have two different kind of incentives to motivate um, ship owners to continue on this and transition. The eco ships and the new construction ship incentive. So based on 60% of efficient energy design included. Uh, number two, the ship is powered entirely by liquefied natural gas as fuel. And number three, energy efficiency operational indicators. So we just um, evaluate and measure these three categories in, in a ship, and we give incentive according to how many um, reductions and, and use of, of, of eco-friendly um, components, um, and then do the incentive um, as soon as they get to, into our flag. The discounts can be renewed indefinitely, based on the information provided by the vessel. So these are some practices we're, going, we're, we're doing in, in, in our business itself, like in, uh, in our services. Thank you so much. A round of applause, please. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the canal is really quite important to cut emissions. So uh, appreciate all the work you're doing on that. Okay, Daljit, you've been patient, waiting, and uh, could you tell us about the Port of Antwerp? What are you doing concretely in terms of uh, environmental protection? Uh, thank you very much, Mia. I think uh, uh, most of you may know Port of Antwerp, you know, but uh, Port of Antwerp last year merged with the Port of Zeebrug. Now we are two locations and one port. Uh, in terms of environmental, I think uh, when you talk about uh, decarbonization or the carbon neutrality, I think we look at the overall ecosystem. We are a port and we are not just a shipping line. We have a lot of ships coming to our port. So we look at carbon neutrality from two perspectives. One is how do we actually help uh, shipping lines or you know uh, reduce the carbon footprint uh, for those people. And also we look at the carbon footprint onshore, which is basically what we have on site at the port. So if you look at uh, the idea, you know, uh, Port of Antwerp, if you know, uh, Antwerp is the largest chemical cluster in Europe and second largest in the world. So we have multiple problems in terms of carbon uh, footprints, that, uh, carbon uh, emissions that are already there. One is obviously the ships that berth in, they actually emit a lot of carbon dioxide. We have the chemical industry which actually emits a lot of carbon dioxide. So the solutions that we are working on is actually a multifold thing. Uh, for example, one of the solutions on the shipping side we're working on is how do we actually uh, make sure that the ships when they berth in, they get onshore power supply. And that is where uh, we're trying to work with different ports all across Europe and I think everyone is committed, uh, including Port of uh, Antwerp, Bruges, Port of Hamburg, Port of Rotterdam, all have committed together to make sure that we supply them onshore supply uh, and the engines can sh get shut off by 2028. So that's not very far from now that we're talking about. The second uh, is also we are the fifth largest bunkering port. So till now we've been bunkering, uh, you know, uh, ships with conventional fuel. But uh, we tend to become the multi-fuel uh, multi port. And by uh, next couple of years we'll be bunkering low uh, carbon fuels including methanol, ammonia and hydrogen. Also giving uh, ships which come in barges and all which work on electric things. Uh, coming uh, also on our portfolio, we, as I mentioned, we are a port authority. Uh, we don't own much of the operations ourselves, but we have a few tugs. The, the first hydrogen tug that we've built has just been commissioned, and it runs purely on uh, hydrogen. Uh, we do also have uh, something which is uh, uh, methanol-based tugs, so we are operating a few of those operations. Uh, when it comes to the land-based uh, decarbonization, we actually talk about, you know, how do we uh, make sure that uh, the industry is protected, plus the the footprint actually gets reduced. I mentioned that, you know, uh, we had, uh, we have a chemical cluster and the carbon emissions that we do. Uh, just to give you an indication, uh, last year we emitted around 18,000 metric million tons of carbon dioxide in the port area itself, which is huge. And uh, coming back to the Paris deadline, we actually have a commitment for ourselves to reduce that carbon footprint at the port by 50% till 2030. 
what do we, how do we do that? Uh, one option, one is the renew, use of renewable resources. We have, uh, till date, we have almost 130 wind turbines in the port area, and we have capacity to increase more. And these energy is used by companies operating in the port. Uh, could be warehousing companies, could be these chemical companies which are operating. They use these renewable energy sources. The second is, because of the chemical industry, there is a lot of steam that gets generated out. We are not wasting that steam. We are actually using that steam back into uh, heating up buildings in uh, the area, residential area. So we're capturing that. Uh, not only steam, we're actually also capturing carbon dioxide. And we actually uh, capture the carbon and then we, uh, you know, store it in gas field, empty gas fields in Norway. Uh, we also uh, are using that captured carbon dioxide to, uh, along with renewable hydrogen generated in the port area to build up uh, a project which is called Power to Methanol. So we'll be building methanol plants in the port. Uh, one of the other things what we have is the port is a big land bank, which is approximately 90 hectares of land, which used to be an old uh, General Motors factory. And once this factory shut down, the land is completely flattened out. Now, as a port, we would have looked at more commercial angle, like you know, giving it for companies, uh, setting up more warehousing. But we've completely dedicated that space for companies who want to set up in circular economy. And as we speak, we have five concessionaries that have signed up. Uh, including one which is a US-based company called Plug Power, which is setting up a hydrogen plant in the port. Uh, we have another company called Boulder Industries, which is a tire recycling company, and they will be re almost recycling 98% of the tire tires that are coming in, making uh, Boulder Black and Boulder Oil, which could be used for petrochemical industries, plastics, and rubber. So uh, those, those kind of initiatives we are completely taking at the port right now. Thank you so much. Uh, you're doing a lot as well, huh? Yeah. I, we, we are kind of running late on time, I see. We started later than we should, but I think to respect the rest of the program, actually, we, uh, we cut it here. But uh, you wanted to show a, a small film, right? Because, of course, we're talking about um, protecting the environment and decarbonization, and as mentioned by Captain uh, Patankar as well, data and digitalization is uh, kind of uh, the starting point here to measure that we're improving. And you have a one minute film showing uh, uh, what the port is working on that I think could be nice for you to see as a wrap up. Uh, yeah. Just before the fl I just played that film, it's a one minute video, but I'd just like to brief you what it is. It's a real time mapping of the port of Antwerp, what we've done. And how, what do we do with that is basically this is not just a software program. It's actually done with the help of sensors that are placed in the port area. And if you uh, just have an idea of the port area, we are 14,000 hectares of land. Uh, which means approximately 140 square kilometers of area that we're talking about. But this video talks about the Antwerp port. It, uh, it also talks about how we monitor uh, various leakages with the help of drones, with the help of sensors, with the help of cameras. So we know when the water level is rising, when it's decreasing, what's the cause of the delay of particular ships. So I'll just request that to be played, uh, if that can be done. Hope I'm not blocking it. My name is Mick Kinn. Go to the side if it works. Yeah. Good morning and welcome back. General status report. Today is an overall sunny day with a light breeze from the northwest. Port traffic is busy as usual at this time of day with 221 barges and 180 seagoing vessels in port. We're expecting 95 new arrivals and 73 departures today. Road mobility is within efficiency norms. There are two INOs quality alerts in one ongoing event. Would you like to investigate? At 8.51, INOs 22 detected possible hazardous compounds. Analyzing. According to historic wind data and ship tracking, a possible cause might be the chemical tanker My Fair Lady. Would you like to collect an air sample? Please select available UAV. Calculating flight trajectory. ETA in 1 minute 30 seconds. Initiate. Confirmed. I am Apica. Welcome to the port of the future. Please.